On Monday's episode, we started our deep dive into Madame Delphine Lalaurie. Now, as I told you on Monday, Delphine Lalaurie was probably my most requested person to research regarding this series on New Orleans. On Monday, we left off with Delphine Lalaurie about to marry her third and final husband. If you missed Monday's episode, our part one, into our deep dive on this story, then I would suggest watching it first. There is a link to part one down in the description box below. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers on this channel. I've told you before and I'll say it again, we would not exist without you. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is also a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we are going to be doing our part two on Delphine La Lurie. All right, before we get into the story, just one quick little note. As you can see, I'm wearing my awesome It's All a Pantomime t-shirt. It's a quote that Charlie Ward says a lot. It's got, if you can see, it's got Alice from Alice in Wonderland on the shirt. Now, the shirt was designed by my friend, your friend, Liz, who again is the TikTok queen from our community. She's on this channel a lot. And as you guys know, we are going to be doing a giveaway for a couple of her shirts on this channel. I have everyone's names who entered into that contest. The t-shirts are on their way to my house right now. I have the tracking number. I have not received them yet, but once I get them in, Liz and I are going to schedule an episode where we are going to draw names to see who of you guys gets to win one of Liz's t-shirts. Now, our mail here in Atlanta has been really slow the last few months. I ordered a desk that came in, but it took it like, I, mean, I got all these emails from the post office saying it ended up being like a week late. I mean, I don't know what's going on. Obviously, the whole world is in an uproar right now. So that's why it's taking a little bit to do the giveaway. We're waiting for the t-shirts to actually come in so Liz and I can get organized before we do the giveaway so we can get the t-shirts to you as quickly as possible. I also have another giveaway that's coming up with another friend in our community. She makes bracelets and so once I get those in we'll also schedule a giveaway with that as well. I also have a question for you guys. I don't need an answer right away because we're still a couple months out but we're coming up towards the holiday season. Now again I have no idea what's going to happen between now and the Thanksgiving Christmas time for the people in America. You know, we have Thanksgiving and then Christmas, those overseas, that's kind of our big time holiday season. We have the end of November, we have Thanksgiving that goes right into Christmas. Um, I always like to do something in the holiday season to give back to the community. Right now, I know that we're very skeptical of a lot of like nonprofits that are within the big ones that are within our country, but I would like for this channel to at least do something. I don't know what that is yet. I don't know if, if there's a family we can all together sponsor um, to help them with their holiday season. You know, just this time for us to really be good humans and help somebody else out there, a complete stranger that none of us know but needs our help, help them. Um, if that's something that you would be interested in, just kind of consider it for a while. Like I said, I don't, I don't need um, a full idea yet. This is just kind of something I'm thinking about, but I would definitely love your input. All right, let's get started with our part two on Delphine Lalaurie. So when we left off, as y'all remember, she was widowed for a second time. Now again, the first two husbands that Delphine had were pretty prominent people in the world, in the society. And we know that Delphine was part of that elite group. Again, if you are new to this channel, us rehashing some of these old famous stories, we're literally trying to look and see if we saw things that we missed the first time. 
Delphine's story is a very famous story here in America. Everybody knows the horrors of Delphine LaLaurie's attic in her house on Royal Street, which again, we're going to get to in this episode. And we know that sometimes people are just psychopaths. But as we've learned in this Great Awakening, sometimes those psychopaths aren't just psychopaths, but they're part of a particular religion, a religion that requires things like And so again, with the retelling of Delphine's story, I'm hoping that collectively we can kind of look at some of these things and maybe theorize that Delphine might not have been just a person that lacked empathy, but a victim of a dark cult, a victim who went on to participate in these dark cult activities herself. So, of course, most people know that Delphine is notorious. She's known for... Now, I'm probably going to have to bleep some words out on this episode, so if you're able to watch the screen to see the text come up, that would be best. But if you're driving and you can't watch the screen, hopefully when you hear the pause, you know a word's been bleeped, you'll know because of the context of what I'm saying what the word was that I bleeped out. Now, again, there's many speculations behind Delphine's activities. Some people believe that it was a lot worse than it really was, whereas some people believe that Delphine actually might have been an innocent bystander, a scapegoat for maybe her third husband. And they say that the truth often lies somewhere in the middle. And I did a little bit digging into Delphine's third husband. There's not as much on him as other people because Delphine's third husband was from a middle-class family in France. And because he was from a middle-class family in France, we don't have that many documents pertaining to his actual life. But from what we know of his life, I definitely speculate that he was very much involved in her dastardly activities. Janine uses that word dastardly, and I love it, so I'm going to start implementing it into these videos too. Now, again, people, some people believe that Delphine might have been completely innocent, and again, it was her husband who did everything. But between her second and third husband, Delphine lost a total of eight slaves. Eight of her slaves passed away in that small window of time. That's major. Now, we don't know how they actually left the earth plane. Again, as Janine says, trying to be careful with what I say. Some of those people could have just passed naturally. We do know that New Orleans, a lot like Savannah, a lot like Charleston, a lot like many places here in the Deep South, was swamped in infection, disease, very hot, very muggy, a lot, a lot, a lot of wildlife, and again, very dirty. So hygiene, all that kind of stuff could have played into people losing their lives a lot quicker than they do in our modern times. I mean, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Living down here in the South, I don't know how these people managed this area of the world without air conditioning. It's brutal. And so I have to share that even though that's a high number of people passing away that in, are in her, we'll just say her care, she didn't care for them, but her care, you have to also take it with a grain of salt because again, disease, all that kind of stuff. So Madame Delphine LaLaurie's third husband was a man named Leonard LaLaurie. Leonard LaLaurie was born into, again, a middle-class family in France. At 21 years old, he started studying medicine at the Sorbonne. In 1825, Leonard LaLaurie decides to leave France behind and head out to New Orleans to start a new life. He was going there to establish a medical practice and also establish himself with the elites, the Creole elites, of New Orleans society. I guess for Leonard, it seemed a lot easier to grow in rank in this colony versus the well-established social ranks of France. Now we know on his paperwork and his voyage over to New Orleans that he did put that he was a physician, a doctor. However, we're not entirely sure if Leonard LaLaurie 
ever finished medical school. Now, for us in 2021, that's a pretty big deal to not finish medical school. However, in the 19th century, things were done a little bit differently. People could apprentice. People could learn from watching someone else. They didn't necessarily need all the paperwork, testing, and bells and whistles as we do and as we require today. Doesn't mean that he wasn't a good doctor. Doesn't mean that he didn't know what he was doing. And in fact, there's no reports of any type of malpractice coming from his actual practice. In March of 1825, Leonard LaLaurie sends in basically his resume to one of the New Orleans newspapers. He advertised that he was a new physician in town and he specialized in taking off the humps that were on people's backs. Now this is something that still happens today with people. They're kind of born with a misaligned spine and of course we can medically fix that or help people correct that disfiguration of the spine. A lot of times things like humps on a body or a spine that's not properly aligned isn't about vanity. We, we don't want to correct that just so we look good in the world, but it can cause a lot of pain for people. That's the primary reason for wanting to correct these issues is so that people are not in pain. Back in the 19th century, they called this phenomenon a hunchback. And Leonard Lollery was the self-proclaimed specialist at fixing this birth defect. And this is how Delphine, a two-times widow in the city of New Orleans, a lady of the Creole upper class whose father and husband were both very prominent members of this society, met Leonard LaLaurie. Delphine was 38 years old at this time, and Leonard LaLaurie was probably around 22, 23. Anyway, Delphine brought one of her daughters in to see him. It seems one of her daughters was born with a hunchback. And so she brought her child in, just like any mother would do, to have Leonard correct the child's spine. Immediately, Delphine was taken by this young doctor. At first, it appeared that her relationship with Leonard LaLaurie was that of maybe just like a welcoming committee. In fact, that's still big here in the South. If you move to a small town here in the South, you'll have like the church ladies from the local church will come and bring you a welcome basket and try to help you get integrated into their society. So that's not surprising in itself that she started spending a lot of time with this young man. Now, 38 for us in today's modern society is not that old. I'm 38 and I still feel like I'm very, very young. But at this point, again, different time. Delphine had already been twice widowed. She had five children and a couple of her oldest daughters had already been married and had children of their own, making Delphine a grandmother. Very soon though, it became apparent that Delphine and Leonard were much more than just friends, mentor, mentee. Because in 1827, Delphine LaLaurie gave birth to Leonard's child, a child that was born out of wedlock. Now, in today's society, that doesn't matter at all. But again, we're talking about the 19th century. And we're talking about the 19th century in a southern town with an elite group of people that live by certain rules outside in public, even though we know we, they live by different rules behind closed doors. At this point, Delphine was living out on her now deceased father's plantation. After her second husband had died, she sold their townhouse on Royal Street in order to pay off some of her second husband's debts. Now again, Madame Delphine LaLaurie herself independently was very wealthy. We spoke about this in part one. This was something very unique to this town of New Orleans, that women at this point, even though they still didn't have some of the rights as men, they were able to own their own property and have their own wealth. And that's part of what makes this story intriguing, because at this time, Delphine, even though she was a woman, held the upper hand in a lot of situations because of her social status in New Orleans. Gossip started around the town that this young new doctor, Leonard LaLaurie and Delphine, the widowed woman who had had his illegitimate child, had a very passionate and sometimes what we would call toxic relationship. They were constantly fighting and she was constantly throwing him out of the house. Well, after the birth of their son, 
Delphine and Leonard did get married. Something interesting that uh, somebody else pointed out to me regarding this case is that their son was baptized five months after his birth. This was around the time in 1827 when they also got married. Now, normally at this time, people would baptize children pretty quickly out of birth. We've talked about this with the changeling episodes we did, the folklore on changelings, because we didn't know how long children would live in superstition about baptism at this point was rampant. It still kind of is. And people felt like they needed to get their kids baptized so that if something were to happen to their child, their child would be able to go into the kingdom of heaven. Even though I have my suspicions that Delphine LaLaurie was not actually a Christian. In their marriage contract between Leonard and Delphine, it is stated that their illegitimate son would be recognized as a legitimate son and therefore upon their passings he would receive the same inheritance as a legitimate legally born child would receive. I know that sounds so crazy to us today because at this point if you're someone's kid you're someone's kid and most courts view children of parents whether the parents are married or or not as equals when it comes to inheriting the estates of their parents. But these social constructs were really important back in the 19th century. Now I know, you know, everybody watching this knows that our federal government is very much C-A-B-A-L. The validation of someone's existence at this point because of the power of the C-A-B-A-L was placed on whether the parents were married or not. And we know that God doesn't make junk. So children born out of wedlock are just, as much, are just as valuable as children born within wedlock. It's part of the reason why my boyfriend and I have not gotten married yet. In our opinion, we've been together for a very long time. We are married in the eyes of God. We've made vows to each other. We have boundaries within our relationship. And that, in, my, in our opinion, is a marriage. I believe God knows that we are married because we are committed to each other in the way a spiritually married people should be. We haven't legally gotten married at this point because we don't want the C-A-B-A-L involved in our relationship. Once everything flips, we'll see what happens. But that's kind of our perception on that. And looking at the case of people like Delphine LaLaurie and her children, you can definitely start to see the red flags of a C-A-B-A-L, mind-controlled indoctrination, control of the masses. I hope that makes sense. Now, as you can imagine, another scandal regarding Leonard and Delphine once more was their age difference. In this time period, it was common for a young woman to marry an older man. We saw that with both of Delphine's first husbands. However, when the tables were turned and the woman was older and the man was younger, it was kind of like a social taboo. And in my opinion, the only reason why Delphine survived this social taboo is because of how much power she held in the social vortex of New Orleans at this time. In fact, her oldest daughter, who had children of her own at this point, was two years younger than Leonard LaLaurie. But nonetheless, in 1831, Delphine LaLaurie decides that it's time for her her husband, Leonard, and their children, the ones that are still living with them, and of course the new baby, to get off the plantation out in the country and move back into the city center of New Orleans. This is when Delphine LaLaurie bought her very famous house on Royal Street, the house where the shit went down. And of course, most people know this is the house that stands at 1140 Royal Street. Now, when she bought this house, she put the whole house in her name. Her husband, Leonard, was not party to owning this property. Again, this was really, really, really rare at this point in our history. And if we're looking back at the 19th century, again, the fact that Delphine could do this shows you, A, how powerful she is and how much wealth she had. Now, once she bought the property, she began to build her mansion. At first, the mansion was only two stories. The mansion you see today is three stories, but we're going to get into what happened after the shenanigans went on there to change the 
layout of the house. On this two-story mansion, there was also a slave quarters. This is very common in these old cities. You see these quarters in Charleston and Savannah as well. In fact, if you go to like Charleston and Savannah and probably New Orleans, you'll see people that live in these old antebellum houses that have these actual quarters still on their property. A lot of these quarters have been like re refurbished and they rent them out as like single apartments because we know the quarters are very small but they are being rented out as like a single person apartment now. Now just to note since we spoke about American Horror Story last week the house they showed in American Horror Story is not actually the real house that Delphine LaLaurie lived in. They used a different property to show her house. So if you're a fan of American Horror Story, especially season three Coven, you're going to notice that the house I'm showing you in this story looks very different from the house that you saw with Kathy Bates. I don't know why they did that. Maybe it had to do with like filming rights from the people who own the property now. Maybe they just didn't want them filming there. Who knows? But nonetheless, I just wanted to point that out. Now again, as I said, the marriage between Leonard LaLaurie and Delphine LaLaurie was very, very rocky and what we would probably call today toxic. Now we see in 1832 that Delphine did petition the court for a separation from her husband. She actually claimed that her husband was physically A-B-U-S-I-V-E to her and had a few of her children actually back up her claims and her complaint. Well, even though Delphine filed for this petition, we know nothing really happened with this separation because Leonard was present for the parties and on that fateful day that all hell broke loose. But as I said, this was common for the LaLaurie's. They were constantly like breaking up, getting back together, breaking up, getting back together. Around the time that Delphine bought her property on Royal Street, 1831, was also the time where more rumors started around Delphine. Now again, living in a high society, in any society, you're probably gonna get talked about. I mean, in the modern times, we have a whole franchise of reality TV that revolves around the antics of very, very wealthy women in social circumstances. This, of course, is Bravo's Real Housewives series. So rumors weren't uncommon in New Orleans, but these rumors had to do a lot with the way Delphine treated her slaves. As we talked about in part one, there was a code noir that had been given to New Orleans, the people of New Orleans, over a hundred years before. This was a very detailed law book of how the um, owners could actually treat their slaves. And people were noticing that for Delphine, her slaves were showing up in markets looking worse for the wear. And in fact, between 1831 and 1834, Delphine LaLaurie lost 12 of her slaves, mostly like the eight that she lost before she got married to her third husband, leaving the body count now at 20 that we know of. The ones that lost their lives were typically young women in their early 20s or teenage girls. Now again, this could have just been from sickness. It could have just been what it is, just bad luck. But the fact that it was young women and young girls is pretty interesting. We know that people in these circles not only participate in SRA, but they also we know that different ages and different genders and different races carry particular types of genetic coding in blood. And so it is very fascinating and interesting that um, it was particular people that were losing their lives. Again, young women and teenage girls. The rumors hit a precipice when a story about a young slave girl named Leah started to move around the town of New Orleans. It appears that Leah, who probably was anywhere between the ages of 8 and 12, was tasked with the duty of brushing out Delphine's hair every morning. Well, one morning, as what happens to most girls at some point, little Leah hit a snag in Delphine's hair. And of course, when you hit those snags, 
it can be quite painful. Well, the story goes that Delphine took her pain out on this child. The child then took off running from Delphine as Delphine allegedly was trying to whip her. The poor child was so terrified that she got to the balcony of the house and jumped off. This, of course, caused little Leah to, as Janine says it, leave the earth plain. Legend states that her final resting place is in the backyard of the Lothlary mansion even to this day. Well, this particular rumor triggered a bit of an investigation. Now, this investigation is not a thorough investigation that we might see today. Again, Delphine Lalaurie was a very prominent person in New Orleans society. I mean, think about all of our prominent people in our societies. Think about the Clintons, for example. We know that there have been many people around them who have left the earth plain, and yet they haven't ever been publicly charged with anything. Well, after the story of Leah in the investigation, a lawyer was sent to the Lollary house and basically kind of told them to cool it. Watch out. Remember the Code Noir. For your family's lineage and your family's names, stop doing things to trigger these rumors. But on April 10th of 1834, a fire broke out in the kitchen of the La Lurie mansion. The fire was started by a 70-year-old slave woman who was chained to the stove. The woman started the fire as a means to try to remove herself from the earth plane. This 70-year-old woman had had enough. She also claimed that when people went up into the attic, they never came back. And she herself feared because of something that had happened earlier in the week that she herself would end up in that attic. And if this meant her life was going to be over, she wanted to take that into her own hands. The New Orleans Bee was a newspaper that ran in New Orleans three times a week. The newspaper had opened in 1827 and it was ran in French. Now there were a lot of newspapers at this time in cities as there were in other cities too, but most of the New Orleans people tended to trust the New Orleans Bee. Now we in 2021 understand a thing or two about the media. We know that the media is very sensationalized and we know that sometimes they don't quite tell us the truth. All the information that we have today of what happened at the LaLaurie Mansion on April 10th of 1834 comes from eyewitness accounts that was written about in New Orleans newspapers like the New Orleans Bee. I say this because, again, many people believe that some of these stories and the accounts of these stories were sensationalized. And in fact, over the course of the months Post the great event of April 10th, many of the newspapers in New Orleans got very competitive with their information regarding the shenanigans at the La Lurie Mansion. There even came a time where different newspapers were calling each other liars. But nonetheless, what we know is on April 11th, 1834, the Babylon Bee posted an article explaining what happened at the Lalaurie Mansion. Again, a fire had broken out in the kitchen. The fire was started by this 70-year-old woman who was chained to the stove. It soon spread throughout the whole house. This was in the morning time, post-breakfast, right before lunch. As the passerby started to approach the burning house, patrolmen came up asking Leonard Lollery for his keys to the slave quarters. He wanted to go make sure that he could evacuate all of the people living on the property. It stated that Leonard refused to give this police officer the keys stating to basically mind his own business. At that point, the passerbys decided that they were gonna break into the house and into these quarters to physically remove the people who were still stuck inside. In fact, one of the passerbys in the area was none other than a judge. From what I understand, what I've read, it appears that this particular judge kind of took over the evacuation process. He was the one that basically gave the people permission to break into the house to remove 
these human beings since the Lalleries refused to give up their keys to the quarters. Well, when the people broke into the quarters, what they saw shocked them. The human beings living in these particular quarters were pretty beaten up. They had wounds all over their bodies, and some were attached to the wall by chains around their neck. Some had had their arms and legs stretched out so much to the point where they wouldn't have been able to physically walk themselves out of the house anyway. They needed the help of the passerbys. This also ended up exposing Madame Delphine Lalaurie's Attic of Horrors. Now again, this is portrayed in American Horror Story Season 3. And what they show in her attic is pretty gruesome. However, some of the experiments that people say she was running on her slaves have proven to not be accurate. It just seems that she was mostly... Now, this particular judge who was, who was telling people to basically break in and get these people out really believed that Leonard was also involved. Yes, Delphine got most of the heat. She was the one that was accused of being extremely, extremely psychopathic towards her slaves. But this judge believed that Leonard was involved, and I, I do too, because you know what? Leonard was a physician, and a lot that was going on with these slaves seemed to come from medical knowledge. We'll just put it that way. We also know that Leonard was very, very eager to social climb. We see what people, young celebrities in Hollywood, are willing to do in order to get that contract. People who don't have souls will do anything to feed their own narcissism and ego. At the realization of what was going on in the Lawlery Mansion by the bystanders, absolute hell broke out. Now again, rumors had already been going around for years now that there was something very dastardly and nefarious happening at the La Lurie property. Many of the other Creole elites were very concerned by the way it appeared Delphine treated her slaves. And so when they saw that had been happening behind closed doors at the La Lurie mansion, the bystanders went ballistic. Right after lunch every day, Delphine had this habit of taking a carriage ride around the city. The person, the coachman who drove her carriage, tapped Delphine on the shoulder and told her that things were about to get nasty. He suggested that she very casually get into her carriage, just like she did every day for her afternoon rides. But instead of coming back to the house, she needed to leave. So Delphine, her husband Leonard, and the children that were living with them did just that. They very calmly got into the carriage. Now as the carriage was taking off, a lot of the bystanders realized what, would ha what was happening and ran up to the carriage to try to physically remove the Lalleries from the carriage. The coachman ended up whipping the people back as he took off. He brought Delphine, Leonard, and their children to a river that took them down to Mobile, Alabama, where they were then eventually able to make their escape. Now, when the coachman got back to the Lollary property, the people at the property were so upset at what happened that they actually ended up taking his life. Now, again, what ensued was vigilante justice at its best. The bystanders ended up completely destroying the whole of the original Lottlery mansion. This is why today, if you go to New Orleans and you visit this house, you will see that there are three stories instead of two. It's because the house basically had to be rebuilt. According to what I could find, all of the slaves living on the property were brought into the local jail. At this jail, they were cared for medically, and what proceeded was basically they were put back up for sale again. They had people come by to view them and then make purchases so they could be dispersed out away from the Lottery Mansion. As far as Delphine, Leonard, and their children, some things are a little bit hazy as to what happened to them after they escaped the mob. We do know that Delphine and Leonard remained in the United States until at least April 21st. 
That's my mother's birthday, April 21st. We know this because on April 21st, where they were hiding out, both Delphine and Leonard signed the power of attorney over to her daughters and her daughter's husband. At this point, some people believe that she went to New York. Some people believe that Delphine snuck back into New Orleans living with her daughter under a different name. But what we do know for sure is that they absolutely went back to France. They went back to France on a boat to live with Leonard's family. They spent many, many years in exile in France. And from what we know, with letters written back and forth, Delphine was not that happy in France. She felt like she was high society. And of course, Leonard's family, the Lala Reeds, were just middle class. We know from letters written back and forth from Delphine's youngest son to his half-siblings in New Orleans, Delphine was always very eager to get back to New Orleans. It almost seems from the letters written that Delphine was a little bit in a delirious, delusional state. It was almost like she had forgotten why she left New Orleans in the first place, and her children knew that her return to New Orleans would not be good for her. In 1842, we do know that Leonard LaLaurie's father passed away. At this point, Leonard LaLaurie abandoned his wife and his child in France and moved to Cuba. We know this because Leonard LaLaurie wrote a letter back to his stepchildren in New Orleans requesting that they send some of his personal belongings to Cuba. Interestingly enough, two of these items were, were aprons from his Freemason Lodge. You can't make this shit up. Leonard LaLaurie ended up passing away in Cuba where he is still buried there today. We know that Delphine LaLaurie passed away at the age of 64 in 1849 in Paris, France. It is said that she was buried in a specific cemetery in France. From what I read, it was actually a third class um, cemetery, but nonetheless, she was buried amongst some great artists, some famous people, and there's still a tombstone there for her. However, many people don't believe she's still there. Her son, her son from her second marriage, bought a really big plot, a really big family tomb. We have talked about these particular tombs in our second episode of New Orleans where we spoke about the Carter brothers and I will include that episode down in the description box below because I go over how these specific tombs work. But nonetheless, her son from her second marriage bought a plot basically for his family at nice. the St. Louis Cemetery number one. Now, her son and his immediate family were not ever buried in this particular tomb. In fact, we know for sure that it was like his great granddaughter that was the first person of the family that we know for sure was buried in this tomb. This would be Delphine's great, great granddaughter. However, on this tomb, there is a actual nameplate for Delphine La Lurie. Many people believe to this day that she was exhumed and brought back to New Orleans and placed in the family tomb in her hometown. Now this is interesting to me because again, this was the 19th century. It wasn't like they could preserve bodies and there was no airplane. It wasn't like they could quickly get her body back to New Orleans to place it to rest in her hometown. It would have taken a really long time with a rotting corpse. So even though we have records that she did pass in Paris in 1849, some people think maybe those records were altered. And maybe the rumors are true that she did return back to the scene of the crime. After all, that's what many criminals end up doing, right? They return back to the scene of the crime. Now, as far as I know, no one's ever cared to look into the tomb to see if they can perhaps find any remains of Delphine. I don't even know how they would be able to determine if the remains were hers or not, unless she still has some living descendants that would be willing to give their DNA to check. I have no idea. But what I do know is that her gruesome life has fired up folklore 
for many, many generations. And because of the mystery of her life in exile, there are legends around her final resting place. We do know that the La Lurie Mansion is supposedly haunted. In fact, it is said that that house now carries a curse and anybody who owns it ends up having bad fortune fall upon them, including a very famous actor named Nicolas Cage, who did purchase the house in 2006. He is no longer the owner of this house. From what I understand, as of today, the people who own the house are private citizens. I think many people would love to have the house be a museum, like it was in American Horror Story. But I guess time will only tell with that. But for those who have spent time in the LaLaurie Mansion, they do say that Delphine LaLaurie still walks the halls of her home. And maybe sometimes you can still hear the screams coming from the attic. All right, guys, let me know your thoughts on this story down in the description box below. Do you think that Delphine Lollery was just a psychopath who did what psychopaths do? Or, like me, do you think there's more to Delphine Lollery's story? Do you think that she was born into a C-A-B-A-L family and that what she was doing was more of um, religious intent versus just psychopathic tendencies. What about the fact that Leonard LaLaurie was a physician with medical skills who also, as we now know, was a Freemason? Again, let me know your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. Thank you again to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the full song, there is a link again down in the description box below. Thank you to Todd for helping me get this video out to you guys today. I hope you guys are all gearing up for a fabulous, fabulous weekend ahead. Much love to all of you. Hold the line. The best is yet to come, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.